Okay. Right, is this working? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Echo. <laughs> testing? Okay. You can hear me as got well. It. Let's see if I can sit with it. Yeah. Great. Well, hi, everybody. Thanks for being here today. Happy International Women's Day, by the way, for all you, all you fierce females out there. <laughs> um, I'll just take two seconds to introduce Kiln. I think a lot of you are probably members, but uh, we are a boutique, lifestyle-oriented co-working brand. Um, we're really about not just being a desk, but um, creating real community and networking opportunities and opportunities for our, for our member companies to grow and support them as they do that. Um, we have different types of memberships all the way from club where you can kind of drop in and rock up with your backpack all the way through to private offices. If anyone is here that hasn't had a chance to experience Kiln, feel free to uh, take a go meet our people at the front desk, Gibson and his team, and they'd be happy to give you a tour. So. I'm uh, really excited today to have an opportunity to speak with Roy Banks. Thank you for being here, Roy. Thanks for having me. Um, Roy is the CEO of Weave, right across the street here, one of our neighbor companies um, right over there. And um, uh, Weave is an all-in-one kind of communication, uh, payments, analytics, engagement, engagement yeah. platform for communicating with your customers for small and medium businesses. Correct. Um, Roy has been at Weave for about a year and a half and led them through their IPO this past fall. Yep. So I'm sure that has brought some changes to yep. your life. So look forward to hearing a little bit about that. Um, Roy was a real pioneer in the payment space. So in the digital payment space. So if you ever make payments online for e-commerce, you can thank Roy. <laughs> he had a lot to do with that. Um, so uh, he helped launch some of that when he was the CEO of Authorize.net early in his career. Um, he most recently served as the CEO partner at Tritium. And prior to that, he was president of the Load Pay Business Unit and a board member for Truck Stop, where he helped their payment initiative grow into the leading payment solution for that industry. Um, he also served previously as a CEO at Network Merchants and Open Edge Payments. And early in his career, served in the US Navy, and he holds a bachelor's in business uh, from Utah Valley University. So he spent, you've spent a lot of your career in Utah. I That's think, right. right. Almost all of it. Great. Yeah. Excellent. So, um, Roy, I'd love to start with just talking a little bit about your journey. So you joined the tech industry from a little bit of a less traditional path um, from the Navy and then getting your degree through the GI Bill. Yeah. Um, and would love to hear about what brought you to tech and what that journey has looked like and, and culminated in coming to Weave. You bet. As strange as this may sound, I'm just going to um, answer the question after I make a statement, um, I uh, am profoundly impacted uh, by what's happening in the Ukraine. Um, having served in the United States Navy um, and having donned a uniform and uh, taken an oath to defend the freedoms and liberties that we have as a country, um, I think sometimes that doesn't resonate or ring home with us until we see um, nations that are under oppression like um, our uh, friends in the Ukraine are under uh, oppression. And it just, uh, I'm inspired by the Ukrainians and their uh, desire for peace and to be a sovereign nation. And it just reminds me about how blessed we are to live here in the United States of America. And we have, um, you know, men and women um, and uh, people of all walks and types that are willing to stand up and, and uh, defend our nations and our freedom. So I just wanted to say that because it um, means a lot to me. Um, yeah, I've had an incredible journey. I feel like um, the, uh, the things that, that I've been able to achieve in my career um, are less about me and I'm more about what other people have done for me. Um, when I was in the, I joined the United States Navy because I was trying to put myself through college. I was married. Um, we had a, a, a child that was sick, and um, I couldn't afford to work and go to school at the same time and nurture a family. So I joined the service and um, with the idea that um, I would be able to provide a means to support my family, serve my nation and or my country, and then also uh, earn the GI Bill. 
um, for $100 a month for 12 months, you earned at the end of your enlistment the opportunity to have your, your college paid for. And I thought, wow, that's awesome. So I did that. And what I chose to do in the United States Navy was I wanted to be a software engineer. So I got my training as a software engineer, moved to Utah um, immediately after um, I got out at my enlistment with the Navy was completed and um, joined some old, I'm 55, so I joined uh, some old dinosaur companies called Word Perfect and Novell <laughs> back in the day where I worked in research and development in the international group. And, um, and that's how I got my start in the, tech, in the tech space. But I owe it to the Navy. It was a wonderful opportunity for me to get the education and even the experience that made me a valuable um, uh, employee to a, uh, to a software company. So deeply indebted to and have much gratitude for the military and what it did for me. Great. And um, talk a little bit about your decision to come to Weave and why. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So honestly, this has been really hard for me because <clears throat> I have lived most of my career in Utah in anonymity. Most people don't know who I am. And I've been here for since 1992. This is the fifth time I've been the CEO of a company. I've had uh, four other companies that I've literally acquired and brought to Utah. Um, Visa is here because Visa ended up buying one of my companies. Global Payments is here because Global Payments bought one of my companies. Um, I think I'm responsible for probably about $3 billion worth of shareholder value that's been created from companies I brought to Utah and, um, and thousands of jobs. And um, so i uh really proud of that that work history, but never really sought opportunities to get on a stage like this and talk about mm -hmm. who I am, what I've done, and, and didn't understand how important it, it was for me to do that. Um, I was literally retired when I was contacted by Weave, um, one of the investors at, by Weave, um, who asked if I would be interested in um, competing for the job of CEO at Weave. So I retired literally when I was uh, 50 years old. And I was retired for just a little over three years when I received that phone call. And here's what I failed at. I failed at a lot of things. The one thing I failed at was I thought you just made a lot of money and then you retired as soon as you like got a lot of, <laughs> a lot of digits in your bank account, right? You don't? And yeah, you don't? no, no, no. You got to have a plan. And I didn't have a plan. Um, I woke up every day, worked out for two or three hours, took a mid-morning nap, ate lunch, took an after-lunch nap, and then you know, Netflix and I don't know, did the yard, did, did yard work. I did that and I was incredibly <laughs> bored. And, um, and I, and I just found out that I, it was really important for me to, to be engaged in something industrious and meaningful. And with the opportunity to join Weave, I was intrigued by the, the, uh, uh, opportunity to take the company public, which is something I've never done. And, uh, and, and also to lead one of you know these tech unicorns here in in, in Utah, and uh, and as you know, we've had a great reputation. We've had an incredible footprint and impact on the community, and so I just felt like this was my opportunity to um, really give back to the community and really do something that I haven't done and be challenged by something that was new to me. And the other thing, and I, part of the reason that we're here, is with the national discourse that we're seeing in our country, you know, with movements like Black Lives Matter, we see the, divis the division in our politics, you see the, uh, the effects of social media. I, I just became aware of the fact that I, I think I can be an agent of positivity and change and start right here in my own backyard. I thought, you know what, I'm an African American, and we're going to learn more about that in a minute. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm the first African-American that has led a unicorn, a unicorn startup or tech company in Utah. And I was going to take a public company public. So I looked at what can I do to, like, really, like, help change the narrative and really bring what I think is a lot more um, parity and um, transformation in the dialogue and discourse that we're having as a, as a country. And doing that starting at Weave. And so Weave's given me some incredible um, platforms and opportunities. And I'm here talking to you guys. I mean, would never have thought I would be doing that. And this means a lot to me. It really does. I mean, look, you guys came because, you know, obviously you got a free meal. Um, <laughs> that always helps. But, but honestly, you know what? It's, uh, you guys are taking an interest in me. And I want to share what I think is um, 
inspiring and motivating with you. So I hope you can pay it forward to the to the people that you influence. So that's why Great. I came to Weave. Amazing. Love it. Um, so you have been through multiple exits and acquisitions before, but this was the first time you took a com- company public. So let's talk a little bit about that before we get into some of the other topics. Yeah, so you bet. What was that like, first of all? And also, you know, going public kind of changes some of you know, how you have to lead a business, right? Yeah. Instead of just thinking about your customers and your team and your, your investors, you're also thinking about a, a market and the analysts and how they're going to, how they're going to interpret your results, et cetera, which sometimes leads to some interesting trade-offs between short and long-term thinking. So curious how that's been for you and how that's changed um, your work at Weave in the past months. Yeah. Um, so, you know, with, with any company or anyone who starts a company, if you have a lifestyle business and it's just a business that you're just going to milk to survive and earn a great living for your family, that's fine. But there's also this other side of capitalism. And it's this idea that you're building an entity of value that you hopefully one day will be able to monetize for financial gain, right? And when you build a company, you have a couple of options to exit. You can sell to a strategic company and they buy your company and they swallow it up like Google and Oracle and all the big companies do. Or you can um, sell to a financial sponsor, like uh, like a private equity firm. And I've done those two things. The other one is to take a company public. And there's probably beyond the scope of this discussion, there's all these different trade-offs and advantages and benefits and disadvantages and um, challenges with doing those. But um, we decided that the best path for our shareholders was to take Weave public through an IPO, an initial public offering. And we commenced that process back in the spring of last year. And we decided to choose the New York Stock Exchange. It could have been the NASDAQ or the New York Stock Exchange. It doesn't matter. They actually compete for your listing, by the way. It's, pretty, it's a pretty interesting process. I didn't realize that. There's some costs associated with listing on either one of the exchanges. But at the end of the day, it's about parity in terms of, you know, your, your stock isn't going to trade better on one exchange versus the other. A lot of people think the NASDAQ used to have the reputation that it was more of a tech-friendly exchange. Well, we decided to list with the NASDAQ or, or the New York Stock Exchange. But I can tell you, it was the most fascinating and uh, memorable experience of my career. Above, above anything else I've ever done, it was incredible. Um, we listed with the New York Stock Exchange. I'm a veteran. We actually went out on November 11th, which hap- happens to be Veterans Day. Um, and it's also it was also my 35th wedding anniversary as well. We just happened to be married on that. Um, we we want we went to the exchange and the night before the exchange they they dropped and I don't know if you've ever seen the, the the New York Stock Exchange but they draped this huge banner that said Weave on it and um, and it was nighttime we took pictures out there and that's how they they, they the pageantry associated with going public and then you get to do all these interviews with like uh, uh, you know Cheddar Squawk Box it's pretty cool but anyway. The, the big thing is you, you uh, go into the New York Stock Exchange, and if any, any of you have seen it on t- television, it's so much smaller than it looks. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> you look at this room. It might be a little bit bigger than this room. It's a little bit bigger than this room. Mm-hmm. And um, so that was the first thing that I saw. I was like, wow, this thing looks bigger on TV than it does in real life. And then you stand on the balcony, and if you've ever seen, you ring the opening bell for the trading day, and it's a button that you push. They used to have a, a, <laughs> a, a mallet that you'd ding, ding, ding the bell. But now you hold a button, and there's a lady behind, uh, or the lady, there was a woman who worked there that was, had her hand in the square of my back, and she was putting pressure on my back. And as long as there was pressure applied, I hold the button in. <laughs> and then when the pressure's gone, you let off the button, right? And, um, and it was just really amazing because I am in standing in the iconic assembly of capitalism in the world, the New York Stock Exchange. I'm thinking, oh my goodness, you guys don't know, I'm from Great Falls, Montana. My dad was in the Air Force and retired there. I never thought that someone who looked like me, someone who grew up like me, would end up in New York City on the New York Stock Exchange ringing the bell, yet alone 
as the first African American to take a public a company public out of Weave uh, um, uh, um, out of Utah, and a veteran on my anniversary. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, so yeah, never never thought, but uh, it just shows that you know our effort needs to be sometimes bigger than our ambitions because man, we can do incredible things. We can do incredible things, and I don't know what my path was um, other than hard work and just good decisions, but incredible opportunity. Now, real quick, running a company as a public running a company as a public company sucks. I'm going to tell you that right now. <laughs> We're getting hammered. It's the uh, old adage, uh, you know, um, all ships rise with the tide, while well, they lower with the tide. I am so. Um, it's frustrating because no matter how you perform as an individual company. You know, you're still at the whims of what happens on a macroeconomic basis. You know, if you look at the geopolitical tensions that we're dealing with in, in Ukraine, you look at inflation, you look at the crazy employment market that we have here, um, you know, the big quit, the great resignation, all of that. It, it, it's, a lot, it's difficult to compete in, and the market can be very unforgiving. Um, but at the end of the day, here's what you need to know about the stock market, and it's, this is one of the most prevailing thoughts that I think all of you should remember. The stock market is irrational in the short term, but rational over the long term. It just is. And so if you get caught up in the short term dynamics of the stock market, you better not go public and you better not be an investor in the, in the public marketplace because it's brutal. But over the long term, it is one of the most financially um, uh, sensical investment um, assets that you can that you can invest in. So. And how has it changed how you have to manage our company? Well, you know, um, everything that we do is, it, it's the difference between, I think of it like a, like a play, like a Broadway show, right? When there's a set change, they pull the, the, the drapes closed, right? And you do that behind the drapes. Is a public market, there are no drapes. Everything you do is front and center. So if you make a change to management, you make a change like we did to our sales model, um, you provide a change to your forecast, that's all done in the public marketplace. So there's just a different level of accountability and reportability. And because of that, you have to be much more precise and much more transparent in how you operate as a company. Because the difference is when you're, if you violate SEC rules, they put silver bracelets on your wrists. And you go <laughs> to jail. <laughs> and um, not that you want to, not that people in private companies don't, are, are nefarious or untrustworthy. It, you just have to learn how to operate in the open. And that can be very challenging for a lot of people who enjoy the confines of a private company. And so I would think that that's the biggest difference for us is I have to give, like we just had an earnings call last week, I had to give. Our guidance for Q1, we're reporting later in the quarter than most companies. I had to speak to our performance in Q4, but I also had to give full year guidance for 2022. And I'm already, my stock is already being measured by that yardstick and how we perform against it. And so it's a very difficult environment because if anything happens, I don't have an excuse. I have to, I have to just deal with it. So I think just dealing with the realities of the public market can sometimes be a very challenging thing. So it really requires that we're more precise in the way we invest, run our company, and quite frankly, how we report on what we're doing as a company. Okay, great. So you're a company that you talk a lot about putting people first. And I would presume that that means putting your teams internally first, but also you're working with an enormous amount of small businesses where you really deep, need to deeply understand what they do. And they've, you know, all of those businesses have been through a really rough period now during the pandemic. Um, what types of things do you do internally to really ensure that your teams are close enough to the customer to understand what their needs are? Um, I, did, I, I love that question because it really kind of, we just had a company meeting of, uh, where we kind of kicked off the year <clears throat> at Weave. And, this is something I wish I would have learned earlier in my career. And I think this is a great lesson for all of you because I know it is for me. And we have this phrase, it's called cloaking ourselves in the identity of our customers. Think about that. Cloaking ourselves in the identity of our customers. And what we mean by that is in order to serve a customer, regardless of size, 
You have to be able to empathize with them. You have to understand what they're experiencing, right? And the only way that you're going to do that is you can study it or you can empathize with it, right? You, you have to literally step into their shoes and see if it's challenges, if it's problems that you're solving, if it's solutioning, if it's just making their lives better. It's understanding your customer through empathy. And so we're, um, this is a little self-indicting. I walked into our office at Weave um, six, eight weeks ago, and I just stood in the doorway, stood in the doorway, and I said this to myself. Can you tell what I do for what we do as a company for our customers by just observing what you see standing in the front doors? And the answer was no. You know what we look like? We look like a tech company. You know, we've got moss walls. We've got this, you know, this cool <laughs> vibe, very techy, open ceilings. But you wouldn't be able to, you know what you'd think? You'd think, oh, these guys are a tech company of some sort. But I don't know who they serve, and I don't know what they do. Think about that. So when you walk into an organization that just, ba just based on the physical appearance, you're unable to, dic to, to determine what they do, you've got a problem. You've got a problem. So what we're doing, we're going to show our customers on our walls. We're going to have testimonials. We're going to have pictures of our true customers. We're going to... I bought, you know what I did? I, I wore a pair of scrubs because we service the healthcare industry. I did my company meeting and my entire leadership team wore scrubs. Sounds silly, but you know what? It's meaningful. And so I think um, that's what we do is really better understanding how we can empathize and, and really step into the shoes of our customers. Um, that, that, that to me is how companies build and grow to serve the constituencies that they serve. And that's something that we're doing at Weave right now. Um, we've been successful, but I don't think it was enough. We really needed to identify with our customers and literally cloak ourselves in what they do every day. So I like that. And so we'll see how that works out for us. But I, I'm, I'm fairly optimistic it's going to be pretty cool. And it's going to be very, uh, it's going to produce a lot of results. I want to give one other example of what Roy did during this time period. I remember earlier in February reading, he had posted on LinkedIn and he said, I'm committing in the month of February to post every single day yeah. with a moment of customer empathy. And I'm doing this because generally I find an excuse not to post because I'm too busy. I'm CEO. Yeah. But he said, I'm going to force myself to do this because this is what my customers have to do. They have to run their marketing. They have to schedule their customers. They have to see their customers. They have to do their accounting. They have to make it work. So I need to make it work. Yeah. I love yeah. that. I yeah. loved it. You know, <laughs> I'm not a big social media guy. I, I, you know, there's it, social media, like anything, can be used for good or for bad. And, um, and, but, but, I, but to understand what our customers do. That's the lifeblood of their business now. I mean, we can't escape the fact that social media plays an important part of their, um, of their existence. I wanted to address another part of your question, though, and that was people first. Um, one of the first ways I was introduced to Weave was um, people, not employees, the billboard that you guys probably all saw on I-15 at some point in time. You've driven up and down this corridor. Um, you know... I don't know that the term employees is offensive. I don't believe that at all. But I do believe that employees are people. And if we can remember, an employee is almost like a fungible resource, right? It's like somebody quits, you just hire somebody else, right? You get somebody else to backfill. Um, when you take a more measured approach to identifying um, the people that labor in your business as people, it means that you do things far more than just employ them and pay them a, a, a wage. What you do is you provide them with an environment that makes them comfortable. You, you um, provide them benefits that allow them to succeed and to take care of their families. You provide them with career growth, professional opportunities, and you know what? You provide them with the ability to tap into the things that they crave around creativity, productivity, and contribution. And that's what Weave does really, really well. It does it better than companies that I thought I did a really good job running. And um, people first and putting people first is really important. And that is not just a tagline. 
I, I will tell you, that is a way of life at Weave. It is. And um, challenge you, any one of you to talk to somebody that um, has worked at Weave. And if they told you something different, I would be surprised. We, we do. We work to make our, um, the work-life balance meaningful. And uh, we embrace. And the last thing on this topic, or it doesn't have to be the last thing, but one more comment is I have never seen the diversity that we have at Weave at any other company in Utah. We have LGBTQ. We have um, just, and it's, it, it's because the other thing that we do, in order to serve your customers, you have to look like your customers. Mm-hmm. You know? You have to look like your customers. And seeing the faces of the people at Weave reminds us that that's what our customers look like. And that's who they serve. And so we, we, uh, we've, we do a lot around diversity, equity, and inclusion. And, um, and a lot of people confuse it. It's not just because I'm an African-American CEO. It's because I believe that this is the way that all companies should be, should be run and should be staffed. We should be seeking for the value and the benefits of, a, of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Not to the exclusion of any other group, by the way. Right? Because that pendulum can swing the other way. And uh, so it's uh, this harmonic balance that we're trying to keep. But that's what I love about Weave. I could talk more about those attributes of Weave than what we do as a service and a solution. <laughs> really, I could. I love what you said, and I'm a huge believer in you have to look like your customer. So I'd love to hear a little bit more about how Weave has achieved that. Because, yeah. you know, every, lots of people will say it's harder in Utah, but I think you also just work harder at it in Utah. Yeah. to get there. And I'm curious what you've done at Weave to, to be successful with that. Um, number one, your biggest, the, the biggest recruiting resource that any company has is the people that work for it, right? You can hire a staff of recruiters. You can work externally with a bunch of recruiters. But if you hire the kind of people that you're looking to staff and to create diversity, diversity will take care of itself. And so when you look at our company, it is because of the way that our, em- our people or our employees reach out and tell others about our business. And so our ability to bring new people and to maintain diversity and the levels of diversity that we, that we enjoy is profoundly the result of the people that work for us and how they feel about we. And um, so, you know, we have a bunch of Slack groups. We have a bunch of programs around um, women in tech, um, Latinos, African-Americans, blacks, whatever you want to say. We do a lot to really cultivate and nurture those, those, uh, those groups because um, we, we believe that diversity. There's a, I was in New York. I, I want to read this to you. Oh, I don't have my phone. If I can get this. Um, there's a, there's a quote. I, me and my wife were in New York um, in December when we were at a park, and there's a quote from John F. Kennedy, and it said something to this effect. I'm not going to get it perfectly. It says, immigrants everywhere have made this country great. Immigrants everywhere, from everywhere, have made this country great, I think is what it says. And, um, and I took a picture of it because I was so, prof- so profoundly touched by it because if you think about it, it is. It's this, this collection. It's this Ellis Island of diversity that has made our country so resilient, so great, so innovative, so advanced, so um, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the iconic example of what um, div- you know, th- this melting pot can be in terms of strength and unity. And I love that. And uh, so anyway, I think that whether we're immigrants, whether we look different because of race, religion, um, you know, uh, gender, gender uh, orientation, how you want to be, uh, you know, what's your pronoun. Man, it's a beautiful hodgepodge and cornucopia of just diversity that I love. And we are the benefactors of it at Weave. We see it firsthand. Let me just tell you this. I was standing in the foyer. Every day I do about 30 minutes of duty, is what I call it, in the foyer of our receptionist, <laughs> in the foyer of our company. And I just love to meet all the people that work for me because I have close to 900 employees, so I don't get to see everybody every day. And, uh, and then we, you know, we're constantly hiring new people. 
Anyway, there was a, 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 a an individual walking into the building. And I wanted to say hi. And I could see this individual, what looked like a woman. And, um, and she came up and I introduced myself. And her name was, well, I won't tell her her name. She had an androgynous name. Let me put it that way. And I, and, and I was just meeting with her and I was just, just intrigued by this person. And, um, and somehow, because my mind is programmed, because what I see and then what I say are connected through like these neural pathways, I, I referred to her as she. And every time I said she, she go they. And it was like right after I'd say she, they. And what I was learning was I was learning about the importance of caring and treating people the way they want to be treated. Against my own biases or prejudgments. And that was a valuable lesson for me. Because, you know, like I said, I'm 55. I'm a little older than probably most of you in here. And so you get set in your certain ways. And, um, and, I, and I really appreciated the fact that me and her had a long, me and they had a long conversation. See what I'm doing? We had this long conversation on this topic. And what we talked about just a few moments ago about empathy, I now have greater empathy because of the way they want to be identified in this world and how important that was for them. And who am I to deny them? That, to deny they that opportunity, you know? So anyway. That's great. So it sounds like at Weave, you, you already have a fairly diverse work workforce. You feel good about that. Um, you have various types of um, groups and a support systems within the company that help, you know, provide support for those different groups as they go, which presumably helps with retention and, and all of that. Um, what advice would you give? Because most of our most of our members here at Kiln would be younger companies. What advice would you give a younger company about how to really start integrating the idea of diversity and inclusion in your company culture? Yeah, you know, <clears throat> without sounding old, <laughs> you know. What, what's, what's beautiful about, like, the younger generation, you guys aren't as fixated on race or division as us older generations are. You just aren't. Um, I believe there's a, a greater sense of fairness and equity and appreciation for diversity now than there ever has been since I've been alive. Um, I... Uh, my, so I've lied to you. I'm not an African American. My mother is white as you are. My mother's German. My mother's from Cologne, Germany. My dad is from Texarkana, Texas. My dad joined the Air Force while he was uh, drafted into the service and was stationed in Germany where he met my mother. So I always tell people I'm German chocolate. Right? <laughs> so, but think about that for a moment. Mm -hmm. I grew up with a white mother. And I stand here before you today and I refer to myself as an African American. I never knew my mom was white or my dad was black until I had friends come home and tell me or ask me, hey, Roy, why is your mom white? I never knew that my mom was white. Society told me. Hmm. Think about that. Society told me that my mother wasn't just my mother, but she was my white mother and my dad was my black dad. And so you, when that started to happen, all of a sudden, I stopped bringing friends home. I wouldn't bring my black friends home because I was scared that they would not be my friend because I had a white mom. I lived in uh, Jacksonville, Arkansas back in like 1979 or 78, I can't remember, about that time. And I remember when I had, I went to about a 90% black school. And I remember when um, certain uh, classmates found out I had a white mom, they stopped talking to me. 
I told my mom, no, please don't go to PTA meetings. Let's keep this a secret. I was almost like ashamed of my mother. Think about that. That's the environment I grew up in. My dad and my mom got married in 1960. I want you guys to hear something. The misogynation laws, in other words, the interracial marriage laws, weren't, it was illegal in like, I think, like many states to be interracially married until 1967. The loving versus South, what was it? Virginia, thank you. Loving versus Virginia. That's when interracial marriage or misogynation laws were done away with. My mom and dad, uh, whenever they traveled in the South, my mom would hide underneath of a blanket in the back of the car going to my dad's parents' house because she didn't, they didn't want to be um, lynched. I'm serious. That, and again, you know, I, I don't want to act like I'm a civil rights evangelist here because I wasn't, I was a young child during that era. But it, my advice to you is that um, this generation is so much more accepting. And I think you are now facing not racial um, challenges, but gender challenges orientation challenges. And I would ask you to do this. Be as open and accepting as you are of racial and religious differences, or be as open and accepting of gender orientation differences as you are to race and religious differences, because they're the same. I promise you. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, you know, we have another civil rights movement um, per se, but it feels like it. And um, I would go out of your way to seek for those that are qualified, but also who are diverse. You know, and look, I don't know where you are politically and this. I will never I'm not going to divulge where I am politically, but I can tell you that with the nomination of the new Supreme Court Justice, Mrs. Jackson, or Judge Jackson. President Biden echoes what I'm saying in that the reason that it's important, the reason that it's important that we have a woman of color on the bench is the same reason I talked about as companies, we need to look like the customers that we serve. We need to judge. We need our judges to look like the people that we judge. And um, that's important. But again, I want to be mindful. Let's not swing the pendulum so far over that we, you know, we undo what we're trying to strike in terms of balance. Anyway, long answer, but I've been looking forward to this for a long time. <laughs> I have. I don't get to talk about this to a group of people very often. Anyway. Roy, what do you think? Today is... The, is International Women's Day, which always makes me reflect on some of the things that may be happening in the country and haven't happened from a policy perspective also to help, um, you know, in this case, women specifically advance in terms of reaching senior roles and companies sitting on public boards, et cetera. So there's been some, some policy decisions yeah. that relate to that. What, in your view, is the role of policy in helping to move the needle on some of these things, like getting women onto public boards. You know, at what point is it necessary? At what point is it too much? And would some of that happen naturally anyway? I'm just curious what your thoughts Yeah, are. Um, I don't think it's going to happen naturally. I just don't. I think that there has to be policy-driven um, initiatives that um, uh, uh, force that to happen. Um, I'm very passionate about this, and I'm not just saying that to suck up to the women in this group or the audience, but I will tell you this. The, um, so I was in the United States Navy. Um, I worked for female and male officers. I will tell you, hands down, female officers rock in the Navy. <laughs> I'm going to tell you why. Mm -hmm. So I had uh, uh, the, the fortune of having a female officer who mentored me. And uh, I asked her, I said, what's hard about being a female officer in the military? Her answer shocked me. She said this. 
She said, I have to work twice as hard as my male counterparts. Twice as hard for the same amount of pay and the same amount of respect. I am not taken seriously when I show up. I was like, wow. Hmm. I have to know the rules and regulations of the Uniform Code of Military Justice far better than my male counterparts. That has never left me. And I, uh, not to embarrass her, but Lindsay right here, (laughs) (laughs) one of the most dynamic, self-driven women entrepreneurs I've ever met. Seriously. You guys should get to know her. She is inspiring and, um, quite frankly, is somebody who is uh, an inspiration to young women everywhere. And not only that, but she's overcome so much adversity and challenge in her life and, and still has been an amazing and outstanding doer and accomplisher that exceeds that of men and that are her contemporaries. Yeah. And we absolutely need to make a, like I said, a policy-driven effort to do this. Um, I can tell you that on the New York Stock Exchange, on the NASDAQ, they are now requiring their boards to be constituted with females because they realize that it's important not because of appearances, but because of the quality of contributions that they make to public governance for companies. And I have had the pleasure of working with some amazing and outstanding women, but there's not enough of them. And what we need to do a better job of is we need to, so it sounds like a departure, but I I promise it brings back. I was never told as a child that I could be a CEO. My whole thing was I was going to play college football and then I was going to try to get to the NFL, right? Or I was going to be an entertainer, right? Unfortunately, in the black community, that's sometimes what, that's the aspirations that, that a lot of African-American kids have, right? I'm going to be a rap star or I'm going to play ball. Nobody told me I could be a CEO. Nobody told me I could own my own business. Nobody told me that I could go to school and get an education. Frederick Douglass said that if you want to get truly emancipated, get an education. Education is the true emancipator for everyone, not just slaves, right? Never was I told. Well, we don't tell our young women the same thing. We need to be more um, uh, uh, energetic and expose young women to the idea that they can be in the boardroom as well as in the C-suite. And that needs to happen. And so, yeah, and I think it starts with each one of us here. And so I'd love to see, and I'd love, um, I'd love this day because it reminds me. And there are some wonderful people here. I don't know if you guys know Trina Limpert. Anybody know Trina Limpert? Mm-hmm. Um, Trina is awesome. She's another um, woman that was uh, a, a divorced mother of two, went and got her MBA from the University of Utah is now one of the leaders in women tech, women's tech here in, the, um, here in the Valley. Love, Trina. Need more of that. Great. Um, one more question, and then I want to open it up to everyone else's questions. But in Utah, um, where I loved what you said at the beginning, and you said part of why you came to Weave was because you wanted to be an example. Um, so what do we need to, as leaders here, what do we need to be thinking about to move the needle in Utah? Yeah, um, I moved here in 1992. Last fall, there was the um, Living Color Gala. Anybody attend that by chance? That's where you can start. Mm-hmm. Um, there's the Living Color Gala. The Living Color Gala took place at the um, Brand America. And it was a celebration of women, minorities, and uh, women and minorities that have accomplished great things in business in the Utah area. We sponsored, uh, we were one of the sponsors there. And um, throughout the evening, there's awards given to recognize all of these um, 
incredible people that happen to be um, women, minorities, and immigrants. Um, so a woman from Afghanistan, um, uh, the, the black clinicians who focus on mental health care, which is a huge stigma in the black community. That's all they do. And uh, so what was uh, amazing was I have been in Utah since 1992, and I've never stood in a venue that was packed to the gills with that many people celebrating the successes of these people. And it became very clear to me that when there is deliberate effort made to populate your workforces with people of diverse, of diversity, um, they can do amazing and wonderful things. And so we have the ability now more than ever to attract talent to Utah. I think in any given month, 1,200 to 1,600 new people are moving to Utah every month. It's why all these, why, it's why we can't find a house to buy, right? <laughs> um, but it is, it is incredible the amount of talent that we're importing here. We are responsible for importing that talent and attracting them and finding them because they're out there. They are out there. And so um, I remember, real quickly, I remember when I worked at WordPerfect, I cannot remember the VP of HR's name, but we used to do sensitivity training um, there. And I remember asking the, uh, the uh, VP of HR, can I ask, um, how many, how many it, WordPerfect had about 5,000 employees. How many minorities do you have here? They told, she told me there were about three to four out of 5,000 people. Three to four. And then I got, and then I'm thinking, oh man, you guys must be like racist, you know, or like, what are you guys doing? Why, what? And you know, you know what she told me? And I've never forgotten this. She goes, if you look at the number of applicants, we don't get applicants. I'm like, ah. She goes, Roy, it's hard to recruit to Utah. At that time, most of the employees were here locally in Orem. Just don't get them to Utah. Guess what? People love Utah. I can live anywhere I want in the entire country, even as Weave CEO. If I decided I wanted to go live in Vermont, I just go. I love living here. Um, it's a beautiful place to raise a family. It's a great economy. We have the best economy in the country, by the way. Um, and uh, we have a lot to offer. So we don't we we don't have the stigma that we well. The stigma is not as strong as it used to be, and the resistance is not as firm as it used to be. So it's just opening and expanding your, your, your minds and, and, and how you can play a role in that. And every one of us does. Every one of us has a role in that. Anyway, I think that's how you do it. And I think we're doing a great job of it. Because if you look at it, um, I'm not the only African-American in um, Highland anymore. You know? <laughs> I'm not. I'm in good company. <laughs> Great. All right. I want to open it up to you guys to ask questions. So please fire away. It could be about anything. anything. Any question. Yes. So, oh, good. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a really good question because it really speaks to one of the challenges that you have for taking over a founder. How many of you are founders of your own company? Okay. Let me tell you. you one day, more than likely, you'll walk away from your company. Someone will either pay for your interest in it or you're just going to say, enough's enough. I want to go do something else. Somebody's going to take your place. And you will always and forever look like Santa Claus to your employees. You will. There is no way to follow Santa Claus. Imagine me coming in on the 26th of December and trying to do something else that tops <laughs> what Santa Claus offers. Right? It just doesn't happen. It's really hard. And then when you have to um, uh, be the one to get the company to profitability, tighten up expenses, and then you're like, you know, you're the one who has the, you have to be the fiscally responsible one. 
Um, yeah, it was really intimidating. Um, and I can tell you honestly that I don't know that I've always succeeded or, um, and that maybe I have failed some people and some people have left because things have to change. As a public company, it's very different. But yeah, it is very difficult when you know that you, know, you, you can't buy $130 pairs of Nike Reacts for every person that comes to the company. Because what you were doing with 150 or 200 people, you cannot possibly do with 900 and still maintain a responsible P&L. So it, it, is, it was very intimidating. But it also showed, to, showed me that they, that, that was going to make my job easier to an extent because I don't have to, I, I, I just have to make sure that I'm giving people what they need and what they continue to receive more than um, trying to rebuild that from scratch. But um, yeah, come apply now. We need you. <laughs> no, 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 no. Oh, okay, okay. never mind. <laughs> never mind. Okay, my fault. You stay right up. here. <laughs> stay right here. <laughs> you, you, I thought you said I could use this as a recruiting no. tool. <laughs> I also run a car. <laughs> oh, <okay. laughs> All right. That's why I signed a non solicit before I came here. <laughs> yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. So like typically like so that's I spent most of my career in private equity. So for private equity, it's typically like, you know, 5 to 7 year run, right? That's typically what their their hold periods are. You know, that's by the time that they are they've expunged their fund. They want to get a new fund. They usually want to exit out of their old fund, right? So that's that that that's tip, that's why I love private equity because every three to four years we were starting a sale process and then I exit, right? And you know, unlike when you go public, you know, I'm tied up, I'm locked up, I can't sell any of my stock. You know, I've got quiet periods and I have to do a 10B5 registration to sell my stock and I sell it at the lowest of the lows and everybody on the street knows that hey, Roy's getting ready to sell stock. Let's. <laughs> bang the stock down, right? So it's like you don't get the big exit or payday that you get in private equity. Um, with a, and, and then, right, so I would tell you that in a public, in a public market, you're, you're in 90-day targets. It's every 90 days. I have to get stuff done in 90 days where in a private company environment, you could take two years. You know, like we're doing, we're updating our sales model and literally that process should take six to nine months. I have to do that off, I have to do that in one quarter. You know, because the market's only given me a quarter to really kind of make that transition. So, yeah, it's what you're it's what you're. And so you just have to line up with what you what your goal is. I would tell anyone with a company, you know, they always say begin with the end in mind. I think you need to understand something. You need to know what your end point is and work to that end point. Um, it's like navigation on a GPS, you know, just don't navigate and just drive all over the world, right? You know, have an endpoint and then build a plan that gets you to that point because that endpoint becomes the beginning point for another journey, right? But if you don't have that, and, I, and keep in mind, I have, I have prospected hundreds of business for acquisition and I, I see the mistakes and it's not because I'm smart. I'm not, I'm just... Captain Obvious. I just learned from what I see. And I can tell you what all, that's what I love about coming here. Um, I just walked the floor before we came here. And you get to see the incubation of all this incredible entrepreneurialism. It's the most fascinating energy. It's the most endearing energy. And this is where the future business leaders, the future companies that change the world, make this place a better place. Just create some amazing technology. I'm a tech guy. I'm, a, I'm an engineer. So just I'm, I'm fascinated by this. But, but, I, but I have to ask myself, if I walk the floor and I met with every one of these companies, what their endpoint is. And I would be able to tell you what their success rate just by them being able to define where they're going to be in a certain amount of time. But that's the challenge. Do you do it in a private equity environment, a private company, or a public company? And uh, it's not for everyone. And, no, and, and that's the other thing. Going public is not for everyone. No, being private is not for everyone. You have to figure that out. You really do. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so, uh, I feel like they just a lot of 
you know, to speak up for God, she is challenging to come to like, how can we communicate? I, I will tell you that um, you you shouldn't feel. Um, it's an interesting question because it just came up with some women that I work with. It really did. Um, I have seen men be very dismissive and very um, almost uh, uh, um, 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 denigrating towards women that that speak up. Um, I'll tell you from my experience, it's the, the more assertive ones are the ones who are successful. You got to be in, women have to be thick skinned to compete in a male dominated world. Yeah. You, you, you it, and, and I don't know what it is and I don't want to make all these generalities, but I'm just telling you by, based on observation, boy, the more assertive you are, um, women. And, and I go back to my Navy days, the w female officers. They, man, you could, you could get away with stuff with a male officer all day long, <laughs> not a female officer. Couldn't. Yeah, I just think, you know what? You got to be able to take it. But I would not acquiesce to a male. I would never acquiesce to a male. Never. And if they take that, that, that perspective with you, you know what? That, that's going to be their problem more than your problem. I, and I can tell you right now, it won't stop you from rising. It won't. But there is a little bit of, a, I think, um, an, in, an, in, an inhibition. Because there's this concern that you're going to be typecast, you're going to be viewed as this, you know, prima donna. Oh, I, I think those days are over. I, I love the assertive female. I love the, the idea that a woman can hold her own against a man. And, um, yeah, so I, I'll tell you, I think that's probably more myth than fact for me. So, just, man, just give it to us. Let us, yeah, just give it to us. Somebody else had a question over here? Zach, you had a question? Yeah, I was curious about the last Yeah. Biggest thing is accountability. Accountability. That word seems so elusive and it seems so trite, but accountability. Um, you, when you, so when you're on a ship, like I remember um, an aircraft carrier, uh, depending on the, the class of carrier, you know, you've got anywhere between 35 and 3,500 and 5,000 sailors. If you look at what a pilot is responsible for when they fly a, an F-18, you know, you're talking about a multi-billion dollar aircraft. Um, the decisions that you make in the military involve lives and expensive equipment. <laughs> lives are more important. Um, but accountability is probably the biggest thing. The other thing is um, process and order. The idea that you have repeatable processes that have an exact order that are um, very well defined. In, in the Navy in particular, I couldn't speak for any other one, they have what they call PQS charts. I don't even remember what the name, what, what it stands for. But you go into a compartment and your job is literally posted on a clipboard, probably something different now. It shows you, I was you know, in the Navy when they had wooden decks on ships. But, <laughs> um, and, it, and it basically shows you everything you needed to do to fulfill your job at that location. Because if a sailor died, another one had to step in and take over. And it's that, um, that idea of redundancy, the, the idea that you can still propel a ship forward, you can still carry out the mission by just following order and process. And I have taken that into my, my, my civilian life, and it's a competitive advantage. Any, any veterans in here? I just made everybody feel bad. <laughs> what percent? What percent of our nation has served in the military or actively served in the military? What do you think? Three. Three. It's three. Three percent. Yeah, three percent. I don't know why Ted said that, but 
thought somebody would raise their hand. <laughs> Maybe I'm that 3%, but anyway. Any other questions? Yes, Lindsay. I'm dealing with that now, dealing with it now. Um, you know, I can tell you that if, if it's higher level employees, I'll be very honest with you. I believe higher level employees um, bear more responsibility to resolve conflict between themselves. I really do. I have a higher expectation of higher level employees because they're generally more experienced. They're, they've generally dealt with this type of stuff before. And, um, but the truth is, they often don't, but I do have a higher expectation. Um, the way that the way that we're we're taught in leadership training is you deal with them individually, and then you bring them together um, as and and serve as basically as an arbiter between the two. And but at the end of the day, anybody that will tell you about re conflict resolution, it has to be resolved between the two people that are involved. If they don't resolve it, you can't resolve it. Yeah. So very simple for me, and I know that sounds very trite, but um, uh, it's very, it, I, I have, I have a lot of patience, but the impatience really happens at top levels for younger people or people that aren't as, are, as skilled or as, um, uh, don't have the time in the workforce. I'll take a lot more time to work with them. A lot more time to work with them. Um, there is a book, um, called, uh, it's called, um, by, oh my goodness, I can't believe I, I can't, forgot the book. It is on vulnerability. And I like to encourage people to read this book. I can't remember if you guys are interested. I can, I'll, I'll research it. I forget what it's called, but it's about being vulnerable. And um, uh, one of the tenets of the book is uh, the most uh, the most effective way of, of uh, uh, overcoming conflict is to be vulnerable with the person that you're conflicted with. Showing them that, hey, look, I'm not defensive. You know, there's that, there's that quote that says, would you rather be right or would you rather be married? <laughs> <laughs> right? You know, when, when does principle give way to reason? Right? And so there's all these different ancillary things that go into conflict resolution. And it's a really complicated study. But I don't know if that helps, but it's just, it's an interesting question. And I think it's almost like on a case-by-case -case business uh, perspective. Yes. Um, um, so that, that's a great question because we deal with the, the challenges of demography all the time, right? And um, it's important that not only are, do we have perfect product market fit, but we have demographic market fit, which a lot of people don't understand. It's a really powerful question. It really is. And so when you look at demographic market fit, what we're doing is we believe that in the markets that we serve, that there is a, an absolute inclusion of every, we, we service um, healthcare professionals that are trained, certified, educated, and, um, and continue to receive professional education, right? And so if you look at our marketing literature, the, um, the, the demographic profiles that we alternate, we have women, we have minorities, and we have um, uh, whites. We have, we have um, people from different countries in our marketing literature. And so the presentation of how we suggest or imply um, the demographic market fit is an important part of how we make sure that we cater to all segments of that population. And because the pricing of our product is not based on demographic, it isn't. 
the um, it's the way that we advertise and the way that we go to market with it from a messaging perspective. And that's an important, so I think everybody in here probably knew the word, pro, the, the phrase product market fit, but I, I, I would venture to say that demographic market fit is probably a new term, one that needs to be um, really highlighted and promoted more as a go-to-market strategy. It really does. If you look at it, we're, we're subject to it all the time. You, go to, you watch an NBA basketball game on television. You're going to see McDonald's commercials that feature African Americans. You just are. That's a demographic and a psychographic um, uh, intent by the ad agencies because they know their audience. They know who they're selling to, right? And so just by virtue of that, um, that is something that we all need to really do more to understand. And so I really like the question because we, we're really focused on that demographic market fit. Great question. Where are you from, sir? London, okay. I, I have bought a company in Bristol. And um, so I land in Heathrow and then drive to, across the island to Bristol. Love it. Okay, we'll take a couple more quick questions and then we probably need to wind down. Let's over here? Over there? Yeah, so uh, looking back, if you were five years ago and Oh, great question. If I could go back and talk, remember, remember in Shawshank Redemption when Morgan Freeman, I don't remember the red, was up for. Uh, 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 parole, and he says, if I could just talk to that stupid kid when I was, you know, <laughs> oh, I was stupid. Um, I, I would tell you that if I could go back, <clears throat> the biggest thing I would tell myself is to under this, this is going to sound maybe almost academic, to understand um, financial statements. I will tell you that right now. And I'm not an accountant. I'm not a finance person, but I believe I'm a financial engineer. I want you guys to think about this. We have chemical engineers, robotic engineers. We have software engineers. We've got mechanical engineers. We've got all these engineers. The one engineer that we don't have is a financial engineer because your job as a CEO is you are a financial engineer. You are trying to engineer value in a company. And that's why I've been successful in my career because I finally learned what financial engineering is about. I never knew that a non-profitable company could be more valuable than a profitable <laughs> company. That doesn't make sense, does it? Right? Does anybody know how much money Uber loses a year? A lot. <laughs> a, lot. <laughs> a lot. And look how, look how valuable it is, right? Um, so I would tell you, understand financial statements. P&L, cash flow, balance sheet, and understand how transactions flow through geographically through those elements. Understand EBITDA, understand leverage, understand all that. Understand what a good gross margin is. Understand how it compares to the, the, the sectors of industry that you participate in and your contemporaries. Your question about, um, about what was your other question about CEO? Well, it's about who, because my oh. partner, my partner, yeah. He, yeah. Okay, so, so, oh, you know what? And this sounds like something I, anybody up here would say, reach out to me. Because I'll tell you what I, what I, what I the answer to your question is this. Um, the only way this changes is if people like me make themselves available. And here's the shame of my career. The shame of my career. I was so focused on capitalism. I was so focused on my own rise that I didn't give enough attention to the people that I could bring along with me. And that's the, that, and I, and you know, for all of you who are entrepreneurs, that's going to be the struggle that you have. You're going to be, you don't understand that the work you're doing now is so inspiring, so motivating, but what you have and what you've already done is so valuable as mentors to mentees, to people who want to be you. And that is why I came out of retirement. It's exactly why I came out of retirement. It's exactly why I came here today. 
This is not the first thing I, this is not the first time I've done this in the year and a half I've been back at work. And what I'm finding is I'm really probably, honestly, my time at Weave will come to its natural course. I think I found the next stage of my life. And that is to be a mentor to those that perhaps are unaware of what they can be and don't have access to people like me. And I am the benefactor of people who took an interest in me. I had a board spend $150,000 on CEO coaching for me. I'm like, who does that? And what, what did they see in me that made me worthy of that investment? You know? But, um, but that's what we need to do. We need to look at how we can cultivate those seeds of, of, uh, of the next generation of business leaders. And so thank you for that. That's probably a great way. And we had yeah. one more question over there, and then yes. we'll have to wind down. <laughs> nice to Hi. meet you. Yeah, so um, we have a, um, a leveling exercise that we do at Weave. Very proud to share this with you. Where we look at, um, equity is, a, is an interesting term, right? Um, but let, let's talk about the gender pay gap as an example, right? We know that the gender pay gap is real, okay? If you guys are thinking it doesn't, it's not real, I'm, I'm going to share with you that it is real. Women and minorities make far less than their male counterparts. Just is. It's the, it's the truth, right? And it's systemic. It's systemic. And, um, but through deliberate and judicious effort, we're able to, um, to address that. And the way that we address that is we have a leveling analysis where we look at do we have a problem in our company with a couple of things? Where do we have leaders at the senior levels that are represented as um, minorities, females, and other, right? Um, are we deficient there? Um, what is the gender pay gap? And what are we doing to fix the deficiencies that exist, even at Weave? Okay? Um, and uh, so unless you recognize and make an effort, I have a chief people officer, Angela Balfour, who is amazing. She came from Facebook and Instagram and is wonderful at helping us do this. Now, the sad truth is that in order to cure that deficiency, <clears throat> it's going to take time. You have to work it through the financial system, right? The other thing that we do is when you think about equity and just in the equity um, asset of ownership in our business, we are very good about sharing in the ownership of our business by giving options or RSUs to new employees. And again, being mindful of the, uh, the deficiencies in, um, that I just mentioned, we also make sure that we balance those to make sure that they're, they're, they're appropriate as well. So this is, that, that's another thing that really when I, when I look at our payroll and I see those disparities, they, they jump out off, off of the page and, um, and they need to be addressed. So I would, I would you know, and, I'll, and I'll finish this, I'll finish with this. <clears throat> this is gonna sound self-deprecating, but it's meant to be otherwise. <laughs> My mother was German. My mother taught herself English. And when she came to the States, my, mom, my mom's parents are Holocaust survivors. And when she came to the States, she became aware of the realism of racism. And what she heard and what she saw in our society was she saw the way that people talked. And my mother said, Roy, we'll never be able to send you to college, but the one thing you can do is learn how to speak. Do not let people know who you are by the way you speak, okay? And so I used to read the dictionary every night. I used to have to read the dictionary, and I used to have to read the, I had to memorize at least two to three connotations of a term in the dictionary every night. 
and then I'd have to go repeat it to my mother. The idea was, is I had to understand the derivation of the term, was it Latin-based? I had to understand its pronunciation. I had to understand all the different connotations and definitions of the term. And the idea was, is that I didn't want, if I was on the phone with someone, they could not determine my race. So it's probably why I sound like Urkel when I talk. Okay? <laughs> it's because my, mo no, seriously, but here's the, th here's the thing. I, um, I want to challenge all of you. You know what? Don't do a video interview. Don't do an inter a video interview. Don't put your face on a resume. Here's a, here's a clue for you, Tons, okay? Not that it matters, but I am LDS. Don't put your middle initial in your <laughs> on your resume, you know? Don't do it. Have people evaluate you on the sheer merits of who you are, not what you look like, not what you sound like, not what you believe. Show them that you're the best and most qualified person based on the merits of, what, of, of who you are, right? And I guarantee that if we could do blind hiring and never have to look at someone, we would be more diverse than you'd ever realize because we are all naturally biased. And that's the fight and the struggle that we've got to make. But I, there's no way I'd do a, vir a virtual interview with anybody. I'd, hey, man, I'll pick up the phone all day long. Anyway, sorry for taking so much time. All right, thank you so much. That was wonderful. You're welcome. We really appreciate hey, thank all you your guys. insights. <laughs> appreciate you. <that. laughs> Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. That was great. Did you guys all get something to eat? Oh, yeah. There's food in there. <laughs> Don't go anywhere. I took a lot of notes. Oh, did you? <laughs> <laughs> awesome.